Hi everybody and welcome to a Vassals of Kingsgrave podcast on the War of the Roses and parallels to A Song of Ice and Fire. My name is Bina007 on the forums of a podcast of Ice and Fire, of whom we are an offshoot of an offshoot, and today I am joined by Nadia. Hi everyone, this is Nadia. Long time, long time podcaster, but you've been away for a little bit, so it's lovely to have you back. Um, I'm kind of... Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's good to be back. Yeah, but maybe just to start off with um, a very quick recap of The War of the Roses, I guess. <laughs> the War of the Roses is a period of civil <laughs> unrest that took place in England in the 15th century. Um, many see it as starting with the rule of Henry VI, who was a Plantagenet king. So uh, the symbol for the Plantagenets would be the white rose. And he was seen as a good man, but a very weak and vacillating king. And ultimately, what we then have is a series of wars in which different people try and usurp power. And the red rose is the rose of the Tudors who ultimately win. And therefore, you get the Tudor dynasty with Henry the Seventh and Eighth. But between that, you have 50 years of really one person taking power, having a small kid, that person dying, people fighting for control of that kid. And you have some really interesting treachery wherein, you know, uncles steal thrones from nephews and people are mysteriously murdered. So evidently, there are lots of parallels to Song of Ice and Fire, which uh, George R. R. Martin himself has acknowledged. But I guess the main periods would be um, the sort of all the initial phase would be Richard, Duke of York, um, for the sake of the crown, really trying to wrest power from the very weak King Henry VI. And then you have the sort of the civil war proper. Um, King Edward IV, his son, becoming king, the sort of uh, Robert Baratheon character, but we can discuss that later. He makes a disastrous marriage, the Woodville marriage, a kind of Rob Stark-esque <laughs> um, marriage, which then precipitates another set of wars wherein we get crowned King Richard III, um, famous from Shakespearean history. And then finally, he is killed at the Battle of Bosworth Field. And um, yeah, we then usher in the reign of the Tudors. So, fair enough to say that we will spoil all of English history, particularly this period, and we will also spoil A Song of Ice and Fire. <laughs> can, we, can we spoil history? Can we spoil history? I assume people know what happened in history, but, you know, I was suddenly thinking, what if people didn't realise Richard III died at the Battle of Bosworth Field? But, yeah, you all should. <laughs> <laughs> You've spoiled it if someone's never read the book. And actually... Um, <laughs> It's not a book, it's actual history. I know, but sometimes the line between fiction and reality is blurred. Um, and I was I would really recommend, actually, I've just finished reading a new book on uh, The Wars of the Roses called The Hollow Crown by a historian, a British historian called Dan Jones, who wrote a very good book on the Plant- Plantagenets before this. And it's really... Um, brilliant and concise and what he's really good at doing is saying how the adoption of the the heraldry of the red rose was very important for the Tudors because they had a very weak claim and how by using symbols of dragons yay and red roses they were trying to um, gain credibility and how this battle using symbolism to make the fiction of the war of the roses what suited them as victors carried on all the way through the Tudor reign so um, yeah he it's a really interesting book both as history, but also as how people use history to tell certain fictions about themselves. Um, so, and lots of dragons. <laughs> so, I think we should probably start off with um, King Henry the Sixth, who is the good man, but the bad king. And I'm going to posit that he is a little bit like Eris the Second, so the Mad King. There are certain similarities between. Actually, I wanted to start out with the propaganda part. Oh, go on then. Um, where, with you know, the, the red rose being pitted against the white one. And we've sort of had that in Song of Ice and Fire with, you know, the black fires taking a black dragon in place of a red one for the Targaryens. And it was kind of, kind of similar because um, the Tudor claim descended from the Beauforts, right, who were illegitimate yes. initially and they were later legitimized. Mm-hmm. And then similarly, the Blackfires were like the great bastards of Aegon the Unworthy, right? So it kind of starts out the same way, and they take this opposing sigil from the main ruling line, right? 
that's definitely, I guess, George R. R. Martin trying to tell us about the power of symbolism. Um, but I did think it was really interesting while we're on symbols that, so when Henry Tudor um, invades via Wales, and I guess the Welsh have always had that, um, the symbolism of the dragon, which is on their flag, and he adopts it very deliberately. And I was thinking that it's really interesting how it's only sort of, I guess, 700 years ago, 600 years ago. But in those days, the concept of the dragon as this powerful and mighty symbol is really real. Like, it's not, people realized, I guess, that these were mythic kings, but they also kind of slightly believed it as well. It's not that long ago. Um, or well, maybe it mm. is. I don't know. True. I thought that was cool. And apparently, you'll like this. Um, <laughs> when Henry Tudor's wife was pregnant, he made her give birth at Winchester because um, that's where the Knights of the Round Table were meant to be. And then, of course, he calls his son Prince Arthur. So he really was trying to align himself with King Arthur. And it would be like, <laughs> I guess, if Danny ever gets pregnant or whatever, or some usurper gets pregnant and tries to sort of have the baby in a famous uh, Blacks and Greens location. And I don't know what it would be. <laughs> Called baby Jaehaerys or something. <laughs> in the set of beer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's pretty desperate, I think, when you have to do that kind of stuff for your authority. Or actually give birth on the Iron Throne. But, oh, that would Jesus be Christ, it's bad enough to sit on it, let alone give birth on it. I mean, the baby would be like cut. <laughs> I suppose there's lots of bits around where you can cut the umbilical cord. Oh, horrible. <laughs> All the men listening to this are just like, oh, too much information. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah so as I was saying I mean I think Henry VI was probably a decent guy but you know he was very young when he inherited the, the, the crown from his father Henry V and Henry V was kind of like the mythic awesome king and I guess no one could really live up to that but he was really um a bad king so for instance um, Henry V had conquered lots of France he's our traditional enemy and Henry VI almost kind of by accident signs bad treaties and loses control and he also ran up huge debt so he has shades of Robert Baratheon about him and I think there's a sense in which the English could tolerate debt as long as you were using it to fight campaigns against the French but if you were just like running up debt just because you're stupid then they wouldn't tolerate it and he he did have episodes of madness actually so when things got bad he would have he had a whole year yeah. where he just um really had a nervous breakdown i think we'd probably call it in modern terms but he didn't know who he was um but he wasn't mad in the eris 2 sense but then how bad was eris 2 i mean what what's your sense of of the mad king do you think that's just bad propaganda um eris was definitely mad i mean we've had we've heard so many times about his talon like nails and his wild hair and his fetish for fire and everything that he did to Raya after he burned people. So he was definitely mad, not in the same way as Henry VI, but I think all of that might have made him incompetent in ruling the kingdom, which was why Rhaegar had to do so much. So do you, therefore, I mean, if we're saying Henry VI, basically, and Henry VI didn't burn anyone. He wasn't a tyrant, right? He was just a bit incompetent. So yeah. I guess we think Rhaegar was justified, but do you think that the people um, who basically overthrew Henry VI were justified? Well, the king's job is to effectively govern the realm, isn't it? And if the king is incapable of doing that, then what's the point of having him? But in a way, I kind of feel that if you look at all the charges put against Henry, they're all abroad. Like it's, okay, he lost the French campaign, but he was really unlucky to come up against Joan of Arc, <laughs> who to some people would be a saint, right? So, I mean, that's kind <laughs> of, <laughs> that's that's sort of deeply unlucky. But I'm, you know, that kind of, yeah, that George R. R. Martin thing, like, would, would the small folk have basically been happy under Robert Baratheon? Would they have thought he's basically a decent king? I think under Henry VI, they probably would have thought he was a decent king, because I think back in England, the crown might have been in debt, but I bet it was basically at peace, and they probably thought, you know, this is okay, maybe. But, but didn't they run up, like, huge debts during the, the war? Wouldn't that have destabilize the economy. One of the reasons I read that Richard of Duke of York 
um, decided to really take action is because when they did lose all of France, finally, because France was um, a very rich country. So then suddenly the loss of income, it was kind of like a tipping point. And the numbers are hilarious. Apparently, um, England at the time was £372,000 in debt and the income was £5,000 a year. <laughs> and, and that actually reminds me, kind of, if, if Rich, uh, sorry, the Duke of York basically started out just being the Lord Protector, right? Yeah. And that's kind of how Rhaegar started out, wasn't it? He was just sort of taking over the responsibility of ruling the kingdom slowly. And did he then become, did he then start having ambitions towards being king? Is that why Eris was so obsessed with him? Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's a little bit unfortunate, actually, because I think, or rather, the book I've just read, the Dan James book, argues that Richard Duke of York um, very much started off as someone who did believe in the monarchy and didn't want to destabilize stuff. In a sense, because he was so rich and because he was so powerful, when Richard, Duke of York, returns from Ireland, where he's been governing on the king's behalf to try and help out in England and, and stabilize England, just being that rich and turning up with troops on your way back from Ireland, people assumed he was going to seize power, which I guess basically shows you how um, bad, I guess, it was in England that people would assume that the advisors of the king um, kind of summoned him to court to say, explain yourself. And he was like, oh shit, they're totally misinterpreting why I'm coming back. And and there was there was a kind of um, a pre-battle battle when some of each side's troops just got into a bit of scuffle at St. Albans. I don't think Richard, Duke of York, really wanted power, but I think the people around him who were kind of influencing him, i.e. Warwick and Salisbury, kind of used it, basically. Used that, that return as an excuse to start something. So if we're if we're going with that parallel, can we can we push Arthur Dade Arthur Dane into that sort of role? Who's the King's Guard are sort of like the first line between Eris and anyone else, right? So they're the ones who have to witness all of Eris's misdeeds. Like they have to watch him raping Lala and just abusing her and abusing everyone else. I, don't know, I think there was something. He sort of imprisoned Elia and her children as well, didn't he? And anyway, they had to witness all of that. And maybe one of them was pushing Rhaegar into becoming, sort of taking over the role of king, slowly. I guess for me is that in this whole horrible mix, maybe Arthur Dane is Warwick and Richard Duke of York is Rhaegar. Um, Yeah, tricky. They might have been headed towards that. But they never, they both died too early. Mm. Yeah, so we'll never truly know, in a way. Okay. But the whole um, body talking at Harren Hall was, always gave me the impression that it was organized to gather all of Rhaegar's supporters in one place and sort of plan what to do next about Eris. So back in the day, Um, this is long before the discussion we've just had, Uh, the widow, Catherine of Valois, marries or has a secret marriage to Owen Tudor. And they have um, two boys. And one of them marries um, Margaret. And Margaret has, Margaret of Beaufort has the son, Henry Tudor. So she gives birth to Henry Tudor in 1456 ish and that's basically when all this is going down so just keep that in the back of your heads is what i was trying to say okie dokie so basically anyway um there are shenanigans right so there's a whole bunch of battles and york and warwick at this point are working together and they're summoned to the great council and you know then they flee and then they fight a battle and ultimately um you get to a point where richard duke of york who i guess is the regar in the situation outwardly declares that he wants to become king and the theory is that he has to do this because um, if he doesn't then the next in line to the throne is Henry Tudor so he has to sort of disenfranchise Margaret so he he's kind of like a reluctant king and so my my question to you was going to be do you think that that makes Richard Duke of York a bit like Robert Baratheon and how far do we think Robert Baratheon actually wanted to be king I don't I don't think 
I don't give Robert Baratheon that much credit. I don't think he thought that far ahead, to be honest. He was just going into some revenge and some killing. And the fact that he became king was just because John Allen sort of talked him into it since he was the closest claim into the throne. Okay, so just, just like a stabilizing got influence. Into it by okay. John Aaron. Mm. It, exactly. And it's, I think, Robert Baratheon never had intentions to become king. I think he was, his similarities to Richard Duke of York are sort of that he was one of the biggest, one of the most important lords in the kingdom, right? He was one of the great, the great lords. And yeah. He was, uh, the closest, was he rich? Um, was Robert Baratheon rich? Very, I think he must have been very rich. I mean, the Storm Kings are supposed to be, like, wealthy, right? Oh, okay, cool. The Stormlands are supposed... I think they're supposed to be fertile. Because in current and, in current Song of Ice and Fire, it doesn't... I guess they were surpassed by the Lannisters and their gold and the Tyrrells and their... Well, yeah, they were probably guns. not as rich as the Lannisters, but I think they were definitely far more important in that they were the closest living relatives of the Targaryens. Okay. So, they were definitely, definitely important. I mean, his father was like Eris's first cousin. Okay. So, yeah, then the parallels so, are actually closer than I really thought then, because there is kinship and there is wealth. There probably isn't the same intention and, and intelligence as Richard Duke of York. And, of course, Richard Duke of York dies, right? So, he dies on the battlefield um, yeah. uh, and beheaded paraded in front of his enemies which is pretty grim so meanwhile Margaret um, flees with her children to Scotland and takes refuge with King James III who is kind of like the Illyrio Mopatis there's a, there's a few Illyrios through this story people who just don't like England and like take yeah. in all our claimants so it's either the Scottish or the French treacherous treacherous people <laughs> um, and I have to be nice to the Scottish because you know they like us now Richard Duke of York dies, and we have the the proper, the second battle of St. Albans, but it's the proper one in 1461. And basically, so this is the, this is where I think the guy who I think is the real Robert Baratheon here is Richard Duke of York's son, who becomes the future King Edward IV. Um, because, and so the reasons I think he's like Robert Baratheon is, when he's young, he's meant to be really good looking. And I think he's like six foot, which at the time is very tall. And all the girls fancy him and he fancies himself and he's really good in battle. Like he wins many great victories against all odds. And I think he's kind of a good guy in a way because um, like he, he lets Henry the Sixth live. Like he, he tends to pardon people maybe too much and, you know, he's quite a nice guy. But yeah, he, he is the victorious king. He's the Robert Baratheon who gets the crown and then probably... And and he has two very troublesome brothers, right? Yeah, absolutely. He's got two younger brothers, both <laughs> who cannot be trusted. And, <laughs> and you know, he has one who's a bit feckless and, and loves himself and the other one who's a very Stannisy figure. But yeah, Edward Edward IV is Bobby B. I think it's very, very clear. Yeah. And the the quote from the book is the new king was it frequently it was frequently said a debauched lecher. <laughs> well, if that doesn't describe Robert Robert Baratheon, nothing does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but actually, there's also a really there's a really cute sentence. King Henry the Sixth sat under a tree, laughing and singing as the battle raged about him. Oh. Aww. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but anyway, um, Edward's king, and he is, I think he really is Robert Baratheon, but he does this totally Rob Stark thing, which is he marries, we need to talk about the Woodville marriage. Yes. What, yes. what was he thinking? What, is oh. he just Rob Stark? Does he just fancy the pants of her? That was probably a big part of it, considering how young he was. He was less than 20, right, at this time? Yeah, I mean, everyone is so young in this period. It's just unbelievable. Well, it's exactly like Song of Ice and Fire. I mean, there's always so much criticism about Song of Ice and Fire where, you know, people are complaining about how young these people are and they're getting married so young and they're having kids and it's all about sex and whatnot. The thing is, back in the mid back in medieval times, people were actually getting married that young and they were fighting in wars that young. And it's just... Our sensibilities have changed with time, and it I couldn't agree was more. very different then. Yeah, I mean, it's worth saying that poor Margaret uh, Beaufort, when she's married off to the Tudor, 
and has her son and he dies. I mean, she's 13, 13. She's a widow and has to be deeply cunning and political, abandoned with very little money um, at 13. So, yeah, you know. So from that point of view, I think George R. R. Martin is absolutely on the money. Um, And I, I guess in real life, as in fiction, you know, (laughs) <laughs> hormones trump politics <laughs> oh dear. so poor edward the fourth he could have banged any princess in europe basically decides to marry this um very comely woman who's actually a widow and already has a bunch of kids and she's from this family which doesn't have much money and um yeah it's hard to know exactly what was going on there <laughs> sorry I was actually I was actually thinking about something. Wasn't Elizabeth Woodville's mother also accused of witchcraft? Absolutely, ja- and, Jacquetta and of Luxembourg. Had, there have been indications in the books about how Jane's mother might also be using, you know, magic and stuff. To... Really? When? Where? I missed that. Like, not exactly magic. Like she's giving Jane tinctures and stuff to stop her having babies. Why would she want to stop her having babies? Well, there's kind of. Uh, she was giving her something to drink, like some kind of tea, and Jane thought it was to make her more fertile. But everyone's kind of been speculating that it might have been, since she was planning to betray Rob from the very start, it might have been something to stop Jane con- conceiving a oh, child. Okay, okay, this is something I had not uh, figured so out. So I was thinking that might also be a parallel to the to the Woodville marriage oh, okay. since the mothers yeah and, but... oh and and wasn't maggie the frog one of jane's ancestors and she was definitely a witch right yeah yeah okay so that's interesting so yeah jacquetta of luxembourg uh jane uh elizabeth woodfield's mum was definitely accused of witchcraft and actually the historical evidence does tend to back up the fact that she was she was up to no good and doing all sorts of crazy stuff <laughs> but um so but remind me so when rob marries jane does he but he doesn't elevate any of her family he doesn't make her you know uncles sort of high positions in his army or does he is that part of the resentment because that's definitely well, what happens here his C- Catelyn is sort of very distrustful of uh, uh, Sybil Westerling's brother and sh- uh, they sort of come to this, she tells Rob to get rid of him and Rob sort of sends him off with some captives or something. Anyway, he finds some honourable task for him to do which sort of get, gets rid of him for some time. Mm-hmm. And then his, and then Jane's brothers are supposed to be very trustworthy so one of them becomes the the elder one becomes Rob Squire. Okay, so that definitely is and very he's mirrored. The one, he's the one who gets killed defending defending Greywind. Okay, he's he's the one. Her, Jane's brother is the one who, um, I think, releases Greywind uh, when they're trying to kill him, and then he gets killed too. Oh, it's very sad. It's. Okay, well, I think that the point is is that in in the book, it's more about the spurned fiancé's family, the phrase, than getting revenge, whereas there isn't really a spurned fiancé in this case. So it's more, I guess, the direct family, the Woodvilles, who are um, inspiring jealousy from everyone. But there is a kind of version of the phrase, because, so Warwick, also Richard, um, the kingmaker, aka the kingmaker um he had wanted to marry his daughter he ha- he only has two daughters which i guess in medieval time is really a serious problem if you're a power broker mm-hmm. because you don't have Definitely. sons to carry forward your name right so you've got to have them make amazing marriages and so okay he can't marry his daughter to king edward the fourth but he wouldn't have expected that because in medieval times he should marry a foreign princess but he wants to marry his daughter isabella to the duke of clarence so edward the fourth uh younger brother so Clarence I think is very much the Renly because he's a bit you know he's very good looking and everybody loves him but he loves himself and he's quite superficial and I think like Renly it's not entirely clear he would have known what to do if he'd ruled (laughs) (laughs) and he's yeah he's just the pretty boy he was was very easily influenced wasn't he absolutely absolutely again again very similar to Renly who was definitely influenced by the Tyrells if, if at that point Edward the Fourth had said, "Don't worry, Warwick, I have slighted you because you were trying to arrange my marriage to some French princess, and that that makes you look like a bit of a fool," but you can go ahead and marry Clarence to your daughter. 
I actually don't think there would have been civil war, but I think the fact that he forbid the marriage, like, so the Woodville family's coming up and he doesn't even even the balance with Warwick. He just says, right, I'm going to forbid the marriage. And that to me is really the point at which civil war is inevitable and Warwick is going to betray him. So that, yeah. that that's the kind of the fray, the phrase betraying mm. him to Lannister's moment, I think. Mm. And actually, I don't mind. In both cases, I think the phrase get a really bad rap, actually. And I think Warwick gets a really bad rap. But what are you meant to do? I mean, like, are you just well, going to sit the there when power is taken away? I mean, that's the one thing the phrase asked for, wasn't it? The marriage. Mm. And they're denied that. So, I mean, they're definitely going to take revenge, aren't they? They're not just going to sit back. And again, Warwick, Warwick was the one who made Edward King, wasn't he? Yeah. And he's denied even a single marriage. So it's it's understandable why he would switch sides. Yeah. So I just think that in the case of Rob and in the case of Edward IV, I think just very young, very beautiful, very successful militarily. And maybe that just made them complacent about people and, and just really bad man managers. And I think probably... A very good parallel there back back to 1467 um so effectively what happens is warwick turns switches sides he goes to calais in france which is where you go when you're a treacherous rebel and he uh he marries isabel to clarence so the king's younger brother has married a traitor like is there anything as bad as that I mean, in Song of Ice and Fire, okay, you've got Stannis nicking the, the throne from his ne- nephew. But of course, he doesn't think it's his nephew because the nephew's illegitimate. So, but is there any example of a younger brother genuinely knifing the big brother in that way? I was trying to think. In Song of Ice and Fire, I can't think of. No, I don't think so. I can't. Not from any of the great families, I think. Yeah. So I think, I think you know, George, the Duke of Clarence, is basically, he's quite feckless, but he does something really Ooh, maybe, nasty. maybe Princess and the Queen. Um, Darren? Dar- Sorry, Damon, uh, Damon Targaryen. Maybe. So remind me what he, he did. He married the... He married uh, Lena Valerian. Oh, God, your memory is so good. It's, I mean, I'm just trying to remember. He, okay, so I think I think Viserys, King Viserys, was not interested in a marriage with the Valerians, and then Damon went and allied with them and married Lena. Oh my God! Um, well, that that's definitely it. Then I mean, that's basically exactly what happens, right? So, yeah, yeah that's a really good parallel. Um, so there are definitely a lot of parallels with Princess and the Queen, since we have Kristen Cole there, who's actually called the Queen, the Kingmaker. Oh yeah, that's definitely that's definitely a nod to Warwick. Well, that's a very obvious inspiration, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So, anyways, so uh, Warwick, yeah, marries his daughter to Clarence, and then they invade from Calais, and then there's the Battle of Edgecott, and and King Edward the Fourth taken prisoner at Olney. Oh yeah, and then Margaret of Anjou and Prince Edward. So Henry the Sixth's son and wife also return to England because effectively although Warwick's taken power he's doing it on behalf of Henry the sixth I guess and on behalf of the Plantagenet so he brings back Henry the sixth son who's confusingly called Prince Edward Uh, meanwhile like everyone else meanwhile King Edward's also had a son called Prince Edward (laughs) (laughs) so there are basically at this point there are two kings King Edward and Prince Henry running around and then there's three, there's two Prince Edwards running around. Yes. And, and everyone else is called Richard. So, <laughs> <laughs> so for people reading The Princess and the Queen and The Rogue Prince and like complaining that all the names are the same. Yeah, suck it. Cause... Actual history is also. Yeah, exactly. Like that. Exactly. So um, what I really love about this period, though, is they're quite they're quite nice. It's not like the prince and princess and the queen because everyone's allowed to live when they're not in power. So like Warwick sees his power and he can just roll Henry the Sixth out of prison and he's readapted as king and you know the prince comes back and you know it's very cool basically. It's quite it's quite gentle. So at that point Warwick marries his other daughter and to Prince Edward. So he basically has one daughter married to the younger brother of one king. And one daughter married to the son of the other king. So he's totally diversified his risk. 
he was he was an intelligent man and yeah. he had like a finger everywhere exactly he's it's such a tywin maneuver because basically one of his grandsons is going to be king or grand you know i mean it's basically yeah it should work out this was my first parallel to the iron bank because um so meanwhile king edward the fourth is sort of um so he's also fled to the continent and he goes to flanders to the flemish and he is bankrolled to come back to england by city merchants and the idea here is that um they had they were he was so indebted to the merchants in the equivalent of king's landing that they had to bankroll him to come back because if he wasn't king he wouldn't have the means to pay for his debts and what I thought it was interesting here is people always think Cersei is beholden to the Iron Bank, but, you know, they're as beholden to her. I mean, if they want their money back, or do they think that they're just going to write all, all that debt and just back Stannis and Stannis eventually pays it? I don't know. I find that all quite confusing. Hmm. Conspiracy theory time. Is it possible that maybe the Iron Bank went to Cersei because they understood that there was no way they were going to get their money back? Unless ooh, ooh, ooh. Is her? this going to be a new theory? Is this a new theory? It's a conspiracy theory, totally. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying, what if they went to Cersei and sort of made a proposition to her? Since, you know, then there's no way they're going to get their money back unless Cersei takes control of the entire kingdom, right? And has sort of income coming in from everywhere. Mm-hmm. And then they suggest to her that they'll send in sort of, they'll infiltrate Stannis' camp with someone from the Iron Bank Ooh. and sort of screw him over. That would be so awesome. I would love Could it that if that were true. I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly possible, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we, we, to, we can put it out there. we could there. just be playing two sides. Yeah, we'll put it out there on this podcast and see if people pick it up. But that, that would be very Warwick. In other words, whoever wins, they're going to, you know, have a man in the camp, so to say. So I like exactly. it. Be cool. Um... So anyway, for you know, Edward the Fourth, bankrolled by the Iron Bank, comes back to England in fourteen seventy one and wins this like insane victory, which I think the odds against him, I think it's kinda of like Marine as far as how amazing that victory is. And um yeah, so the Battle of Barnet, fourteen seventy one. That is then followed by the Battle of Cheeksbury, when again King Edward the Fourth wins. And I think it's really sad actually, because poor little Prince Edward, so Henry the Sixth son, is killed in the first battle he'd fought in. Aww. Aww. Oh, and That's Warwick's sad. dead. Montague's dead. I wish dead. that had happened to Joffrey. Yeah, I know. That would have been so much cooler. The <laughs> difference is, I, th- I guess the equivalent would have been, um, in fact, this is the equivalent, is Blackwater. So if Tewkesbury's Blackwater, but Joffrey had literally actually gone into battle. Um, mm. Except that he didn't. Because Cersei was smarter than Margaret of Anjou. Yeah, yeah. And so this time, so King Edward IV comes back, Robert Baratheon, and now we have Robert Baratheon 2.0. So this is the kind of King Edward IV character who would send people off to poison Danny because she's now pregnant. So rather than just letting insane old King Henry just potter around in the Tower of London, he actually does kill him. Although technically it's not proven. Um, people have found his uh, bones in the Tower of London and apparently it looks like he was bludgeoned to death, but we don't know that Edward IV killed him. But, you know, you've got to assume... It was in his interest to hmm. do that. Well, obviously, and he's lost his throne once. He he's not going to risk it again. And as long as Henry is alive, it's it could happen. I mean, even with Warwick dead, it's it's possible. Yeah, exactly. And I think that you know, it's really interesting to see the difference between the kind of twenty-year-old Edward who tries to rule the first time very fairly and you know be nice to both sides and lets everybody live and like the second version of Edward who is definitely more Robert Baratheon like he's definitely much more pragmatic and you know at first he kind of pardons Clarence but then basically Clarence plays up again and he just immediately accuses him of treason signs it the death certificate himself and has him killed and apparently he was drowned in a barrel of Malmsey wine what an awesome way to die I think that's really hilarious. Do we have any example in Sword of Ice and Fire of a brother executing another brother? Um, well, I mean, I guess not executing, but um, Stannis having Renly huh, killed. Stannis and Renly. True, true, true. Yeah. Although Stannis, I guess, would probably... I mean, he can claim he didn't know, I guess. But, I mean, yeah. Who are we kidding? Uh, I don't know. I don't accept that explanation. I mean, how can you not know... 
the I like the character progression. I like the fact I'm talking about a real life king as though he's a character in a book. I like the progression <laughs> of Edward the Fourth from the sort of rather naive, beautiful young um, conquering hero into something slightly more twisted and cynical. Um, anyway, at this point we have um, Anne Neville who has been widowed, and she is therefore married to da, 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 Richard Duke of Gloucester. So Richard Duke of Gloucester, I'm guessing we're calling Stannis. I mean, I think Chow Gamer put on the forums today that, yeah, he says, in my opinion, the strongest parallel of the lot, seizing the throne from nephews with better official claim, but of dubious legitimacy. A fine soldier and fair judge who served his older brother and king loyally, faced with a tough choice of supporting brother during a rebellion. Dubiously kin slays to ensure his claim. Determined, decisive, and willing to do what needed to be done, Richard had t- trick tick of biting his lip versus Stannis's teeth grinding. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting little uh, tip. Very interesting. Yeah, but I think I think this is right. Doesn't, doesn't yeah, yeah, exactly. But all I would say is, with Richard, I always think, well, you know, this is where I mean, like, would be the big Stannis defender. I think the difference is this. I think Richard... I don't know if he genuinely wanted the crown for himself. I think he did think that his nephews were the rightful heirs to the throne. But I think he saw that the Woodville influence was still very strong. And, you know, he saw himself being cut out of governance because they were just going to declare one of the princes to be king immediately, like not have a regency and therefore, you know, cut down his ability to influence and... I think it was kind of like he he tried to have the children declared illegitimate and he tried to get the crown because he genuinely had no other option. Whereas I think Stannis was very comfortable with the idea of ruling and I don't think he had any qualms. I don't think he felt cornered. I think that was just, yeah. okay. Those and kids. at least at least Stannis was in the right where, you know, he said, well, they're legi- legitimate and they actually were... Oh, so you think Richard the III is worse thing. because he's making up the... Well, well, nobody knows for sure if they actually were illegitimate or not, do they? Mm. Or has it been conclusively proven that there was a previous marriage or contract to marriage? Well, no, I mean, I think Prince King Edward IV was definitely engaged to someone before he married Elizabeth Woodville. I guess it depends whether you think that a betrothal is as serious as a marriage. But the point is that I don't think anyone at the time really thought that those kids were not the genetic offspring of killing Edward the Fourth and Elizabeth Woodville. It was just whether they happened to be married at the time. Whereas I think it's much more serious in the case of Joffrey because, you know, it, it's not a technicality of whether the marriage had actually been contracted. I mean, it was a different father. So um, hmm. to that extent, King Richard the Third is worse because I think he knows full well that this is very spurious. Yeah, and he did take the, the crown before the boys actually disappeared, didn't, didn't he? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So, well, uh, his nephews were still living while he became king. See, this is my problem with King Richard III. I never understand why he goes for the crown. I never understand why. You know, like, he... Yeah, he had, he had the boys in his possession, right? Yeah, if you have the boys in the tower, you get one of the boys to sign a death warrant for um, the Woodville uncle. You have him beheaded, which is what he did, and then you rule through them. Why do you need to kill them? That, to me, is the unforgivable thing. Exactly. But it's also the ununderstandable thing, and I, and I don't really know enough about this period to really figure it out. But he obviously must have felt backed into a corner, I guess. But again, it's it's never even been proven that it was Richard the Third who killed them. There was there there, are, like there's like a whole list of suspects who could have done it. Yeah, but I mean, I think it's clearly someone who wants to please him. Who is right? at least supporting? Yeah, who is supporting Richard the Third? And to a certain extent, I think you, I think the blame falls very very heavily on him because once, as you said, he crowns himself. And we've learnt the yeah, lesson from King Edward the Fourth that you don't. The boys are fair game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the boys are just a, they're problematic at this point. So, I guess it's the equivalent of Stannis killing Renly, right? If you're going to take the crown, you don't need an, yeah. another potential person there mm. in the wings. So they're both equally culpable. I think it, I think Chow Gamer's right. The parallels are really strong because I think they were probably both 
quite efficient at ruling and, and good military men and very they're loyal to to a king who they perceive to be a good king in other words powerful strong able to keep the peace and as soon as, and legitimate and as soon as you're neither legitimate nor able to keep the peace then it's game over this is actually what got me interested in the wars of the roses in the first place or the princes in the tower it's- yeah, I was, I was, I think I was a kid. I was, I must have been around like 13, I don't know, 12 or 13. And I read about that and I thought, oh, this, this boy around my own age got killed in a tower all alone. Oh. <laughs> so that's how I got interested. Actually, the really interesting thing for me recently, because I've kind of newly gotten back into the War of the Roses is, obviously, a couple of years ago, they found um, King Richard III's uh, skeleton in Leicester in England. And they've been doing all this DNA testing on him to try and discover like how he died and how he lived. And one of the things that I found interesting was is that his scoliosis developed quite late in life. So in the period where he was loyally serving his brother, and actually at the period where he took power, he wouldn't have had a pronounced hunchback. He would have been seen as a good looking manly man, you know. And there's something really um very Shakespearean I guess about the fact that as he becomes more corrupted the hunchback develops which is terrible isn't it such a prejudicial thing but that in a way it's more tragic because it started off with such promise you know that he could have been a good loyal subject and he and he could have been loved anyway in a kind of like medieval karma the next year his own poor son dies who's also called Prince Edward um <laughs> so he's killed off the potential heirs and then his own heir dies and you see to me that just shows how utterly stupid it was to kill the princes in the tower because what he should have done was marry Anne Neville but just say that like a morganatic marriage and say that you know he's taken over rule because the kids are too little but that one day they will you know it's a regency and they'll return to power or something and then he's completely snookered because you know ugh, Yeah, he's got no one to take over. Yeah, anyway, so Henry the Tudor, meanwhile, is now um, a young man. And he declares he's going to marry Elizabeth Woodville, uniting the two houses. I'm sorry, the daughter of Elizabeth Woodville, so Elizabeth of York. And um, he starts to call himself King Henry VII. And he's like poncing around in France. So to me, Henry the Tudor is very much kind of like, well, he's not like Viserys Targaryen because he doesn't have a good claim. But he is like Viserys Targaryen insofar as he seems to be very young, very arrogant, have a huge sense of entitlement and to be poncing around France with not much money, but, you know, with great, you know, splendor. (laughs) But at least he was smarter than Viserys. This is true. This is true. (laughs) But, you know. He was was maybe a combination of Viserys and Danny. Actually, yeah, maybe, maybe the best of both worlds. Um, but anyway, so this is the really disgustingly grotesque bit, and it'll be interesting to see where the parallels are here to Song of Ice and Fire. So obviously, King Henry the Seventh um, promising to marry Elizabeth of York is posing um, King Richard the Third a problem, and obviously he's got this wife who's now a bit older, and who's had a son who's died. So. King Richard III spreads the rumour that he is going to throw over Queen Anne and marry his niece, Elizabeth of York himself. Oh my god, it's so Targaryen. Um, and just is, that, is that authentic? Did, did he actually declare that he was going to marry her? I don't think he declared her? it, but the, the rumours were going around London. And then mm-hmm. conveniently, so conveniently, Queen Anne dies. Um, a poisoning is suspected but never proved. So, yeah, I mean, this is the thing, like, do you think King Richard III actually planned to marry his niece and killed his wife to do so? Or is that just Shakespearean Tudor propaganda um, poisoning his name? First, first killing his nephews and then going after his niece. I don't know. Can one person be that horrible? Well, maybe it's like you've crossed the Rubicon. I mean, if you've already decided to kill your nephews i mean maybe shagging your niece but they're isn't... totally but they're two totally different things aren't they one's just murder and one's actually incest yeah it's very tall like, it is it is isn't it damon married renera after all credible historians have said that yes the rumors were flying around but credible historians have said that maybe he himself spread the rumors in a bizarre political miscalculation 
thinking that it took Elizabeth of York off the table for Henry the Seventh, but it's just like I mean, first of all, going for the crown rather than the regency, I think, was a gross political miscalculation. Killing the princes of the tower second. And then this, I mean, I think it's going to be really interesting when they keep on doing DNA testing, whether they find any evidence of either insanity or tertiary syphilis causing insanity or something, because (laughs) it just seems that up until the point where he goes for the crown, he has been, all the historical sources say that Richard III or Richard of York at the time, sorry, Richard Duke of Gloucester, was like a really sensible advisor, one of the wisest people in the realm, really trusted, really sage, almost like a sort of Tywin Lannister super wise figure. And then suddenly he makes these insane miscalculations. Anywho, so uh, rocking and rolling. So Queen Anne is poisoned and dies. So Warwick, you know, Yabu sucks to you. Doesn't get a grandson. No. Not at all. And then in 1485, Henry Tudor, um, backed by the French, lands in Wales um, and invades. And this is the, this is the, the sentence I love. They march through the mountains beneath the sign of the dragon, aligning themselves with the ancient kings of Britain, such as Cadwallada, whose exploits were celebrated by the bards. I mean, it's, it's so Song of Ice and Fire. Yeah, that's... <laughs> There we have it. Danny's coming back. She's she's Aegon the Conqueror. Come again. Yeah, absolutely. She's gonna be queen. And under the and under the sign of the dragon. So I wonder if if he invaded through Wales, will she invade through Lannisport? But I guess that would kind of be the wrong way around. And does that mean? Does that mean since Henry Tudor married a Yorkist princess, does that mean Danny's gonna marry a Baratheon prince? I was just like, does that mean she's going to marry Sansa Stark? <laughs> Not everyone can marry Sansa Stark. <laughs> and rule as the first lesbian monarchs of... Yeah, no. Um, that would be hilarious. Uh, no, I was thinking I was thinking of Gendry. Well, I wonder if they'd marry Fagon to Sansa. But yeah, Gendry. Yeah. Or Tommen. Since it... Since, well, Tommen is illegitimate. He's not Bar- Baratheon. Yeah, true. He's not Baratheon. So the only Baratheons we have are Edric Storm, who's too young. And Gendry's the only suitable one. How old's, Ed- See, how old's Edric Storm at the moment? New ship. How, how old is Edric Storm? I think he was 10, wasn't he, when he was spirited away from Dragonstone? And how old is uh, Danny right now? 14? No, Danny would be, I think, around... She was... She was 13 when she got married, so she should be around, like, 15. Oh, they can totally 15. still get married. That's doable. Um, but Gendry is so much better. He's just ripped in the TV show. <laughs> 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 oh, I love it. You're in a role. Like, you've done one conspiracy theory about the Iron Bank, and now you've got a new, a new ship. Yeah, That's now it. I'm shipping Gendry Danny. <laughs> Gendry Danny as the Elizabeth of York and <laughs> Henry the <VII. laughs> Seventh. Yes. I like it. I like it. <laughs> with Genji being Elizabeth of York, of course. Yeah, yeah. And Danny being Henry <laughs> Tudor, but with a much better claim. Um, and anyway, so what do you think of this? So not just in Shakespeare, but in reality, because we have the written evidence. The night before the Battle of Boswell Field, Bosworth Field, Richard III has all these spooky dreams. Richard III woke early on the morning of Monday, 22nd of August, out of fitful sleep, quote, plagued by a terrible dream in which he saw horrible images of evil spirits haunting evidently about him, and they would not let him rest. Let him rest. I mean, does that sound like shadow babies That's or what? <laughs> so what I'm <laughs> suggesting like is, <laughs> I'm suggesting that Henry, the, Henry Tudor, um, yeah, basically... Sent a shadow baby? Not shadow baby, but shadow spirits who were like haunting evidently about Richard the Third and not so letting who is, him rest. Who is Henry Tudor's Melisandre? Yeah, good question. But you know, if he wants to marry Elizabeth of York, right, maybe they've been in touch and Elizabeth of York has inherited from her grandmother, Jagetta of Luxembourg, her spooky magics. Interesting. I think that's just something really yeah. amazing. Like in, in the whole of English history, how many kings have spooky dreams the night before they die and like write them down? And this is one of the few examples. And it's really, really 
the I, he saw horrible images of evil spirits haunting evidently like that means manifestly like he tangibly around him and they wouldn't let him rest i mean that's like and then like because the other really spooky thing about richard the third is he rides into battle like he's so experienced as a warrior and he decides to ride with the helmet and the crown which is just awesome but at some point he takes it off and then he's like shot with arrows to the head and he dies so why does he take so he's he commits suicide I don't know, but some shit happened, and I think there's shadow babies involved. That's what I'm saying. Or maybe, like you said, he was just mad. Or maybe maybe it felt, I mean, you're riding into battle, like it's not necessarily going to stay on your head, but it's just unfortunate. But I'm just saying there's some, I find it very Song of Ice and Fiery because that you have these kind of weird dreams, and yeah. Or maybe he was just tired of living and he just figured, oh, what the hell, I'm done. Yeah, but after you've gone to all that trouble of seizing the crown, killing your nephews, poisoning your wife, putting it about... But, his, can... own, but his own heir is dead, right? Mm. Well, maybe Elizabeth of York, okay, she inherits the magics from her grandmother, and it's not even anything to do with Henry Tudor. She's like, oh my god, my disgusting uncle is... Le- the hunchback uncle is leching on me. I'm just gonna, like, send some shadow demons after him at Bosworth. I like that theory better. Yeah, uh, that's, that's my theory, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> yes, I I like that better. Yeah. Her taking revenge on her own. But again, all I would say is like it's only sort of like, you know, 400 500 years ago, and this is a period in which myths and spirits are taken really seriously, and it's also fact fans, the year in which Mallory's The Mort D'Arthur is published, so the concept of Merlin and paganism and spirits and dragons and, you know, swords of magic important is very real at this time you know this is the mm. culture in which they're living so yeah but anyway poor um poor richard the third despite being a better better man better military man is is killed he loses the battle and um yeah you can see his skeleton and he's been newly displayed in leicester cathedral i think or somewhere in leicester and um his dead body is abused and humiliated and dumped so that's what they've discovered that after he was killed, people someone shoved shoved a sword up his uh, unmentionable so hard that it broke his pelvis. So the poor bugger. Oh, that's the unfortunate that's use of him. Poor guy. Yeah. Not. I mean. I mean. I know he killed his nephews and his wife probably, and but that's not nice. And tried to sleep with his knees, but still. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's because I love the underdog, but there's just something about Richard the Third. I always, I just, I'm like, you know, it's like a mean with Stannis. Like, I just, I just need to forgive him of everything that he's done and, and see him as it's, the better it's man. It's kind of the same thing, isn't it? Shouldn't mm. we decide Stannis and Richard the Third? Yeah. The same? So if, if so Stannis... So does this mean, does this mean that Stannis will actually take the throne before Danny does? Like, actually take the Iron Throne? But yeah, because why wouldn't he? I'm because... trying to marry Marcella. <gasps> <laughs> and then Marcella uses magics to kill him. Oh, that'd be cool. That would be so cool. Be so cool. We should just write the next book. I think we could write the next <laughs> book better than George. <laughs> yes. Inspired from real history. Exactly. Or real history as it exists in our brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have slightly, yeah. I can't. I don't think we can claim to be relaying the the the, the strictly <laughs> documentarily backed history of the War of the Roses this podcast. This is what happens when it's just the two of us on a podcast. We've got no one to restrain us. <laughs> okay, but let's let's work this out. How would Stannis take the the crown before Danny? So uh, he wins the Battle of the North, so he controls the North and the Wall. Um, yeah, he's got the North and the Wall. He defeats he the, others. the others. If if the others didn't exist, it would be it wouldn't be you know that far fetched to think that he might take the throne before Danny, since Danny is still in Marine. No, but and I think it makes it even more likely because in defeating the others, he would prove to the kingdom at large that he was the true king, who um, had the power to defeat the others who were magics, and that you know, he has their interests at heart and there would be a popular, you know, he would sweep down from the north with people joining his cause, but, take King's Landing and rule. But the thing is, Danny is the one who has dragons who are going to defeat the others, right? Oh, okay. 
Well, we don't know that. Or maybe once he has the north in his control, he just says, oh, screw the others, I'm going south. Does he, can he use the others to defeat the dragons? Or do dragons always defeat the others? I don't know. I don't know enough about the others to say <laughs> I like the, the concept of Stan's just sitting right down for a parlay with the others. Look, listen, chaps. <laughs> <laughs> I know your whole mission is to come and invade us, but why don't we get together and just like go after some dragons? That'd be cool. And I'll just give you all the land north of the wall, impermanent. You know, no, that isn't going to happen. But it would be awesome. Okay, so we've we've gone somewhat off track. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after the Battle of Bosworth Field, my horse, my horse, my kingdom for a horse, which never happened. Um, Richard the Third is dead. And Henry the Seventh does indeed marry Elizabeth of York, and he creates the symbol of the Tudor rose, which is the red rose superimposed on the white rose. And he creates this whole heraldry, which is where we started the podcast, which, you know, Henry Tudor has basically very little blood claim to the throne. It's so tenuous. But by creating the red rose, he's equivalent to the white, and he takes on the heraldry of Cadwallader's dragons, and he makes his wife give birth to their son Arthur at Winchester, which is the seat of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And uh, yeah, the the propaganda vac- victory is complete. And actually, what's kind of quite cool for feminists, and this is slightly Queen of Thorns, is um, he his mother, Margaret Beaufort, the poor 13-year-old widow, who has backed him and backed him all the way through till now, and is now an old, wise woman. He basically makes her... Um, a sort of a woman, a femme sole, which is a sort of technical thing, a legal thing, to say that she can have property in her own right, which is unusual for women. And she can also sign herself Margaret R. So she's almost like the Queen Mother or the, the Queen. Queen Regent, which is really cool. And he always takes her advice. He always puts her on his councils and she becomes really, really important and powerful. So, yeah, she definitely is like the Queen of a lot more. A lot more powerful than Elizabeth of York, actually. Absolutely, because Elizabeth of Elizabeth. York is there just to spit out kids, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> whereas um, Margaret Beaufort or Margaret R is there to, to rule and to advise. So that is kind of like the end of the War of the Roses. But then we have the imposters. So we get the Fagons, um, which is definitely yes. a clear parallel. And there's there's two, actually. There's, there's Lambert Sibnall who claims to be this is literally a year after he's crowned he claims to be Edward Earl of Warwick the son of George Duke of Clarence who was actually alive at the time so it's like a really retarded impostorship and all that happens is Henry the Seventh gets the real Edward out of prison and just like parades him through London um, yeah and then, and then eventually kills him well, no. I mean, the imposter right. actually um, basically was... is captured and, and is made a squire in the king's service. So it's... Yes, but the other, the, the actual um, Edward who... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He kills him. I mean, he... actually, I, I was just surprised he was still alive, frankly. I thought that was hilarious. Yeah. Um, so Lambert Simnel, I think that's just a really retarded way to try and... Imp- don't don't be an imposter <laughs> for someone who's actually already alive. Although that is, I guess, going to happen with Fagon Aegon. I mean, is there a real Aegon? Out there, I today. Uh, I think it's a little too late for a real Aegon to be out there. Mm. Well, I thought it was a little too late for George to introduce a Fagon, so. Uh, but history suggests. Yeah, so even... <laughs> this is how it happens. Um, and then the, the, the more serious one is so, again, to give you context, um, Henry Tudor basically um, crowns himself in 1485, so six years later, 1491, a Breton French again merchant called Perkin Warbeck, well that's the anglicised version of his name, uh, claims to be the elder of the two princes in the tower, Richard Duke of York, who at this point would have been 17 had he survived. So I think this is really Fagonish, like even the age, because how old's the fake Aegon Targaryen at this point in Song of Ice and Fire? 17, I think. Yeah, so it's absolutely perfect, right? Um, So this Fagon turns up and he's backed by Charles VIII of France, dastardly man. And he gives him an absolutely massive army, uh, which Henry takes quite rightly as a declaration of war by France. And then there's all these invasions. And actually, this goes on for another five years. So Warbeck um, tries to invade via Kent, which I think would be very similar geographically if you think of Westeros' England to where um, Fagon invades. But actually, it's repelled by bad weather. And then he sails via Ireland, 
which would kind of be the sort of castly rock end of things, up to Scotland, and he takes refuge with King James the Fourth of Scotland, north of the wall. Um, and then five years later, the Scots invade North England on Warbeck's behalf. So, you know, Henry the Seventh has to live with this imposter with a massive army for a long time. Um, but, you know, the Scots invade and it's not successful and Warbeck is captured and he's brought before the king, he confesses and he's hung at Tyburn. And you can actually go, Tyburn Cross is in London, It's if anyone's been to London it's at Marble Arch. Um, and all, lots of people were hung there, so you can actually go to the site where Fagon was killed. And that's pretty much the end of that. Yes. So does that mean that Aegon is going to be around for, until the end? Well, five years. I mean, that's that's a long time. But I think the exactly. difference... I mean, he's, he's, we've already seen Aegon win like a couple of victories, right? Well, maybe that would have been the case if... Um... Like, if George had had the five-year gap in his narrative, because if you think about it, there were five years between when Fagon first tried to invade England and failed, and then came back via Scotland five years later, whereas I wonder if um, George would have had an unsuccessful landing, and then five years after the gap, he came back. Because now he's already landed, Mm -hmm. right? So I think this will wrap itself up quite quickly now that he's actually... Like, once he actually got to England, Perkin Warbeck was killed quite quickly. Hmm. But I suppose the difference is at that point, King Richard III was a very, like he was an in control, not King Richard III, oh, I'm talking nonsense, King Henry VII was in control. <laughs> so, you know, there. I mean, who? where is the king who's going to, who's going to fight Perkin Warbeck and bring him to King's Landing at this point? Danny. Yeah, but Danny's not there yet. Danny's the one who has... So that's but my... Danny is Henry VII, so it's... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Except for the much better claim to the throne. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But um, I think Danny has to be the one to bring Egon down, doesn't she? Because she's the only one who's you know, reliably Targaryen. Yeah, or that we know that's reliably Targaryen unless there is a true Aegon out there somewhere. Is is Danny gonna be eventually like Elizabeth the first, like the Virgin Queen? Well, she isn't a virgin. Mind she's you, I, she's, mind she's you, I suppose barren. Elizabeth the first wasn't it? But is she? But she's not barren anymore, is she? Well, that's debatable, isn't it? Yeah, and I don't think Elizabeth the first was barren either. I think she just took measures. I think I don't think it's that Elizabeth the first couldn't have kids. She just decided not to get married, and therefore. It, she didn't want to have kids. Isn't it? Couldn't Danny become like Elizabeth? Like she, she decides that you know she's had enough of husbands and whatnot, and she just decides to rule on her own. Well, if she does, I mean that's just like a disaster because just like Queen Elizabeth I, when she eventually dies, there's going to be yet another succession crisis. Um, well, there wasn't really a succession crisis after Elizabeth was there. Yeah, but we ended up with a Scottish king and Scotland. <laughs> and and look what happened this week. They nearly booted us. I mean, that was pretty crisis driven. <laughs> well, and then after Danny, you'd end up with what? A Baratheon king? Well, who would be or the equivalent of the king Mattel? of Scotland? It would be the king in the north. So it would be... Sansa Stark. Like, whichever it way we go, we end Sansa up with Danny Sansa. <laughs> That's the new ship, the Danny Sansa re- uh, joint. <laughs> joint rule we always just end up with Sansa of the throne somehow Sansa she's my girl Sansa's gonna be on the throne yes like if at any point reading the next novel or any of the next novels Sansa dies that's it like I'm not reading (laughs) (laughs) I will take that as George breaching faith with me like (laughs) it'll be like the red wedding I'll be throwing the book against the wall but it'd be fine if he kills Arya because she's dead anyway Arya how is Arya dead well, the, the, the frozen in the snow with this sword in her hand, sword in her hand, frozen, or her in the snow, something, I don't remember, but there was something. Okay, well, I'm going to have to edit that out because, you know, Amin will not be happy. No, no, that's not, that's not a spoil, that's, that's from one of Bran's visions, I think. Oh, is it? Oh, okay, okay. I've really got to yeah, reread these books, you know. I've suddenly realised. I don't. I don't remember exactly when this was, but I think it, this is one in one of the the earlier books. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Or it's in John's dream or something. It's in one of the visions. Mm. 
But who's yeah. like who's the heir to the north? I, I mean, uh... Jane's well, baby. Jane's baby. <laughs> Did you just? <laughs> <laughs> it's all about those birthing <laughs> hips. Um, no, I was just trying to think that maybe like Danny doesn't, or Danny comes with the dragons, and like she's a disaster, and the dragons are a disaster. Well, they they kill the others, but basically they're 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 feckless and have to be killed and somehow she ends up dead and then John is revealed as a targ and he starts ruling and then maybe he marries his niece no his uh his sister his, his half sister Sansa that's quite targish thing to cousin. do that also no gets... but she's his cousin not his half sister oh yeah 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 okay well then under Pakistani rules that's okay right yep definitely okay job done there we go John and Sansa <laughs> Sansa's on the th- throne again <laughs> I know. Not that I'm trying to rig this, but I am kind of trying to rig this. Yeah. Who's who's next in line after Danny? I mean, if we if we consider that John is maybe illegitimate, then who's next in line? Because Gendry is also very illegitimate, isn't he? Well, who's the closest legitimate heir? Well, no. I mean, if because Gendry is the son of a usurper, so you've got to go to the original king. So you've got but to go geez, to Targ first. But Robert is. But if Gendry, if Gendry had been legitimate, he would have been the closest legitimate male relative to Danny. It doesn't matter if his father was a, was a usurper or not. After after John, legitimate. after John, John would be after con- John, obviously. Then so oh if yeah. John and, so if Rhaegar and Lyanna got married, then it's it's all good. So basically, Gendry and Edric Storm. Yeah, Edric Storm, I think, would be Edric Storm is the one who has a noble woman for a mother. Mm. So he might be the one. Mm. But maybe John simply by proximity of blood or something. Okay. So we have come up with, and by we I mean you, have come up with the, the Iron Bank conspiracy theory, various Sansa Danny ships, um, the Gendry Danny ship. And I thought a way to close out would be that if we were to go, I was going to say back in time, but it does, it's not a place that ever existed to go back to. If we were going to go to a, the world of A Song of Ice and Fire and we had Maggie the Frog style, 10 minutes on a wood, woodland lane with um, Danny, and we had to give her advice from the Wars of the Roses to watch out for, what would we advise based on what happened here? Number one, have kids. Lots of kids. No, don't have lots of kids. Just have like one or two. Like, you can have a few girls, like, to marry them off, but preferably just have one son and not younger brothers. Yes. Don't show mercy. Everything? Don't don't keep people locked up, like, who are pretenders. Like, do kill them unless they're your nieces and nephews. Like, don't keep ex-kings just tottering around the Tower of London to be wheeled out by oh, your enemies. Oh, definitely not. No, no, no. Um, Big no. Don't marry people that society would view as being a grotesque marriage and um maybe marry someone who has a similar claim to yours yeah don't don't elevate but don't elevate the the family of your husband above the other major families try and be even try and be fair and when people try and sort of come to you with offers of marriage like take them seriously don't just dismiss them because they probably have a grievance and then, oh my god, I can't believe you're not missing this. The ultimate lesson from the Wars of the Roses is don't take your helmet off in battle. <laughs> yes, please don't do that. Nadia, and you of all people. <laughs> <laughs> How did I miss that? Exactly. Because, you know, Richard III but, but, was in power. Not, he had the big army. A, for Danny, she's going to be riding a dragon and up there, so. But I don't understand why just because you're riding a dragon, you still wouldn't need to wear a helmet. Well, you should. Safety rules indicate that you should be wearing a helmet while riding a dragon. Because but if you were swooping down and like breathing fire on people, someone could still like fire an arrow up at you and like shoot you in the head. Oh, this was so much fun. I'm really, I really missed podcasting more... with you. <laughs> yeah, I, this was actually a lot more fun than I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like the good news was it wasn't a history lesson because. Yes, Queen Margaret of Cersei. We didn't discuss that. We should have. Margaret. Um... Margaret of Anjou, uh, Cersei. Well, she was yeah, kind of, yeah. She, she was more military than Cersei was, wasn't she? she well, was I think sort of... she, I think she was just more clever than Cersei was. Yeah. 
and she knew when to leave. I mean, the the key thing is, is she always had control of her kids, and when she left with them to the continent and came back, I mean, she didn't lose control like Cersei lost control of Joffrey. Yeah. Um, Joffrey was just crazy. She's. So Chow Gaiman ma- mentions Francis Lovell as Eddard, homeboy and advisor of King Richard the Third. Both were friends of Richard Neville, where they became friends. Was extremely loyal to Richard, called his dog Direwolf. Richard and uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know about Francis Lovell. Chow Gamer, you should yeah, have come on, then yeah. he could have told us. Oh. <laughs> maybe, maybe you should like record a little audio clip about Richard Lovell, and we can play Francis do Lovell. We, sorry, do we have like a John Aronish figure? Is that so? Well, Chow Gamer has put Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, as John Aron. As stated, he warded two players in the next generation, served as fixer for a future king by organising support, and there was tension between him and Margaret Cersei. The thing is, I think Warwick Kingmaker, I mean, we don't know as much about John Arryn, but I always think Warwick Kingmaker was a bit more, had more agency in a way, like he was more crafty. I think of John Arryn as much more loyal in a way, or much more... Yeah. I don't know, but maybe that's he just... He was definitely, he was... I don't think John Arryn would ever have betrayed... Robert Baratheon or Ned Stark for anything. I mean, he considered them his sons. They weren't wards. I mean, if, if so, for instance, if John Arryn had had a daughter with his first wife, and then when Robert Baratheon was whoring and becoming generally a bad king, would John Arryn have had the balls to have married his daughter to Renly and then back mm-hmm. Renly in open warfare against Robert? I don't think so. I don't think he would have had it in him. I think the problem is, is we don't really know John, do we? Because he dies as the book opens, so we uh, and we don't, see. But I think it's it's sort of his history that he's lost. You know, he's lost his sons, he's lost his nephew, and he sort of replaced them with Robert and Ned. Yeah, I agree. And actually, he actually considers them his sons. So I think Chow Gamer, you need to come on the next history of Westeros slash Song of Ice <laughs> and Fire slash England podcast and uh, make your case because I think we're not entirely convinced. But um, other than that, I think I think we're done. I think we're good. I think we've done a very um, whistle-stop tour of the Wars of the Roses and <laughs> come up with some crackpot theories. So our work here is done. Yes. So with that, I'd like to thank you all uh, for bearing with us and listening to the first um, <clears throat> Real World History and Song of Ice and Fire podcast. And uh, yeah, it's been really fun. Thank you very much, Nadia, for joining me. Thank you, Bina. And um, hopefully, so yeah, let's try and do an, another one. I'd like, I'd love to do one on the English, uh, what's known as the Anarchy. So the period before the oh, War of the yeah, Roses, yeah. so uh, King Stephen and, and uh, all that kind of craziness, Queen Matilda. And I think Chow Game was talking about doing one about Chinese history and the parallels there. So um, that sounds really awesome. Mm-hmm. I look forward to listening to it. So with that, thank you for listening. And um, yeah. I don't know. Are there any podcasts you're involved in, Nadia, coming forward? Are you doing the Silmarillion? No, I, I was going to, but they're doing it. I think they're discussing it very much in depth. And this is just like my first read. I don't think I can. I, I don't think I <laughs> handle it very well. Yeah, me too. I mean, I'm I'm very much think, looking forward you know, to listening, but not participating. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. I think we were sort of irreverent with Lord of the Rings. And I don't know if you can do the same thing with the Silmarillion. <laughs> Well, I, I really hope White Raven's involved with those because I'm sure he'll find some way to, <laughs> yeah. to, to slam elves and uh, other people. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, listeners, so you can look forward to there's going to be a big Silmarillion reread. They're doing the comic book podcast part two is happening. I think they're recording this weekend. So there's lots of good stuff coming coming out soon.